It's been 50 years since humans set foot on the moon. Entire generations were born after this historic accomplishment, but humanity has kept its eyes on the sky and vowed to return. This week marks the end of the beginning of that journey, the completion of Artemis 1, sending a human rated capsule around the moon and back again. With Orion safely back on Earth, let's look back at this amazing accomplishment and ponder what comes next. It feels kind of surreal, doesn't it, that we're talking now and the Orion capsule has returned from the Artemis one mission. And yet here we are, it's over. I think I can finally breathe a sigh of relief. For those of you who haven't been watching the day to day operations of the mission, all of the politics involved, I thought it'd be a good time to give a summary of the entire Artemis one mission. I'll go into the history of the Artemis program, the constellation program that led into it, all of the events that led up to the launch of Artemis one, the mission itself, all of the highlights and the recovery, the return and what comes next for humanity's return to the moon. All right, let's get into it. After the Apollo missions returned and the last crew of Apollo 17 came back to Earth, there were no more missions planned to go to the moon. And it was expensive. It was a tremendous technological achievement, but it was done. The Soviets weren't able to do it. It's time to move on to the next challenge. And NASA turned its direction to the space shuttle and then eventually the International Space Station, keeping its sights on low Earth orbit. And there were no plans to go beyond low Earth orbit for a while. With the International Space Station constructed, with the space shuttle operating, NASA set its sights higher. And under the George W. Bush administration back in the early 2000s, they announced that they were going to be returning to the moon. And the mission was called the Constellation Program. And it was going to consist of two major spacecraft. One was called the Ares five. And this was going to be a heavy lift vehicle similar to the existing space launch system. The other was called Ares one, it would be smaller, safer, it would carry the crew capsule that would then deliver the astronauts to orbit where they would meet up with the larger capsule that would take them to the moon. Unfortunately, building an entirely new moon rocket system was expensive. And unlike the International Space Station, they didn't have the partnership of their international partners. Russia wasn't working with them. I mean, maybe the Europeans would get involved at some point, but there were no concrete plans to work together. NASA was going to be doing this on their own. But the main purpose of the Constellation program was to maintain the workforce. They all of the contractors and employees that had worked on the Apollo program were transitioned over to working on the space shuttle. And as the space shuttle started to wrap up, they needed somewhere else to go. And so there was the development of the Constellation program. And you're probably not going to be surprised to hear but the project was late. It was over budget. And in 2010, it was canceled during the Obama administration. But when I say canceled, the destination was canceled. Humanity was no longer going to return to the moon, but they were still going to build a heavy lift vehicle. And it was changed to be called the space launch system where this was going to go was still not entirely certain. NASA had developed several targets for where the space launch system could go. It could carry a crew of astronauts to an asteroid. It could launch heavier robotic spacecraft like the upcoming Europa Clipper mission. It would just give the United States the heavy lift capacity that it had lost at the end of the Saturn era. Of course, as administrations change, goals change. And in 2017, we got the announcement from the Trump administration that there was going to be a return to the moon, that the space launch system would be adapted to carry humans to the moon. And as part of this announcement, we got three major phases. We got the Artemis one mission, which would send an uncrewed capsule out around the moon and return it to Earth. Artemis two would send a crew of humans on a trip around the moon and return to Earth similar to the Apollo eight mission. And Artemis three would be that mission that brings humans back to the moon for the first time in 50 years, landing in 2024. Now, come on, let's be serious, right? Even though the announced date was going to be 2024, there was really no way they were going to be able to meet that objective. There were a lot of contracts that needed to be filled, new technology hardware that needed to be developed, but still like a goal is good for focusing the mind. And when I think about the reporting that we were doing over the last few years, a lot of it was about how the space launch system was getting delayed. 
the first test was going to be pushed back. It got pushed back months, years. But finally, after many, many tests, many, many delays, in the end of 2022, we finally saw the first launch of the space launch system. I'm like, I don't want to go into all the details, but there was like problems, with the wet dress rehearsal, there was multiple hurricanes that bear down on the space coast, the space launch system had to be carried back to the vehicle assembly building, and then back out to the launch pad. It wasn't the perfect time leading up originally it was supposed to launch in September, and it didn't finally launch until November. And, you know, the costs of this rocket it pretty much $4 billion a piece really starts to sink in when you think about what's on the line here. But with all of those problems, the rocket did lift off on the morning of Wednesday, November 15th at 1:47 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Space Launch System blasted off from the Kennedy Space Center. And even though we had all been prepared and we'd seen simulations of what this was going to look like, seeing this rocket actually take off was mind blowing. It leapt off the pad in a way that other rocket systems just don't so much power. And it shouldn't have been surprising, right? SLS has these two giant solid rocket boosters, it has four RS 25 engines powering the core stage, there's a lot of power on this rocket more power than Saturn five More power than the space shuttle, it really flew. And the entire launch was smooth. We saw the solid rocket boosters detach at the right time. We saw the rocket push through the maximum dynamic pressure. We saw the core stage separate and it extended the solar panels on the European service module. And then the upper stage fired for 18 minutes, putting the spacecraft on the right trajectory to go to the moon. At that point, it also deployed 10 CubeSats that were in a ring that connected the upper stage and the spacecraft. And we'll get more on that in a little bit. And then about eight hours after that, Orion performed another burn that put it on course with a lunar flyby for November 21st. And I've got to say watching this launch, everything went perfect. I was nervous. And I've never really had a chance to celebrate because I was expecting something to fail. This rocket had never been flown before it had gone through two hurricanes It had been driven back and forth from the vehicle assembly building to the launch pad. It was amazing how smooth the entire process went. On day five, Orion entered the gravitational influence on the moon and on day six, it made its first flyby of the moon coming within just 130 kilometers of the surface, It then fired its thrusters, picking up velocity to carry it on a really unique trajectory around the moon. As it was passing the moon, it flew almost directly overhead three of the Apollo landing sites, and then it flew behind the moon and we lost contact with it for a while. So then Orion coasted out to the highest point away from the moon. On day 13, it was about 432,000 kilometers away from the Earth, about 65,000 kilometers away from the moon. And this was the farthest a human rated spacecraft had ever flown. That's not entirely true. The Apollo 10 capsule Snoopy is probably in orbit around the sun somewhere. So it's gone farther. Then on day 16, it fired its engines again, putting it on a trajectory to come back to the moon. Now while it was on this flight, the real purpose of Orion was tested out, there were many different techniques and technologies that NASA was looking to practice during this mission to make sure that they would all work when humans were actually on board an Orion capsule. For example, they tested all the different thrusters on the capsule, trying different modes of flying the spacecraft. They kept track of all of the radiation sensors, both on the exterior of the spacecraft, as well as the radiation loads that the simulated astronauts were receiving as they were flying this far away from the Earth's protective magnetosphere. It tested out its star tracking system so that it would know where it was, even if it couldn't receive telemetry information from Earth. The spacecraft was equipped with 16 cameras. It had essentially modified GoPros on the ends of the solar arrays, as well as many cameras inside and outside the spacecraft. 
And this allowed them to live stream almost the entire mission. So if you wanted, you could just log in and watch out the window of the Orion capsule. Although like it wasn't very exciting most of the time, but still like to know that you were actually watching the view from a spacecraft that was out beyond the distance of the moon was pretty amazing. And on day 18, it returned to the lunar sphere of influence. And once again, it was out of contact with Earth for about four and a half hours. On day 20, it made its second flyby of the moon passing again within about 130 kilometers of the surface. It fired its engine for about three and a half minutes to put it on course to return to Earth using the moon's gravity for a slingshot. One other experiment that they tested both at the beginning and the end of the mission was a propellant test, where they rotated the spacecraft to see how the propellant sloshed around inside, both when the fuel tanks were full, and when they were almost empty. And this is actually really tricky to simulate on Earth under normal gravity. It's only watching how this behaved in microgravity, that they're able to confirm that the technology worked how they had expected. By the end of the mission, Orion had used less propellant than NASA was expecting. It used about 5,500 kilograms and still had about 1,000 kilograms in reserve. It made one final measurement of the Van Allen belt as it passed through. And this is important because we are approaching solar maximum and the amount of radiation that's reaching the Earth and interacting with the Van Allen belt changes over the sun's 11 year solar cycle. The space weather is important for missions like this, and it's a little counterintuitive. When the sun is at its solar maximum, it's putting out the most amount of radiation. It actually puffs out the heliosphere around the sun, which helps to protect the solar system from cosmic radiation, which is a more dangerous form of radiation. But at the same time, you can be more likely to have solar storms and flares and activity like that. And so it's great for NASA to get a chance to be able to test out this environment as we're approaching solar maximum. Just before Orion reached the Earth's atmosphere, it separated from the European Space Agency's service module, which had supplied it with power and additional resources throughout the entire mission. Now Orion was on its own. It entered the atmosphere above the Pacific Ocean going about 40,000 kilometers per hour. And when you just compare this, like orbital velocity is about 28,000 kilometers per hour. So it's much faster falling down from the moon into the Earth's atmosphere. One of the coolest parts of this mission is they performed a skip technique. This is where they actually bounced off of the atmosphere once using the aerodynamic shape of the capsule to provide lift that allowed it to bleed off a lot of its velocity before it actually came back into the atmosphere to perform its final descent. Temperatures outside the capsule reached 2800 degrees Celsius. Now that's half the temperature of the sun but twice as hot as lava. And then the friction from the atmosphere slowed it down to just 480 kilometers per hour. And then its parachutes took over to complete the landing. When it finally hit the ocean, it was going just 32 kilometers per hour. Now you might know, but actually this was the second time that an Orion capsule was tested. The first was launched into orbit a few years ago, traveled around the Earth and re-entered. So they were pretty confident that the landing system was going to work. And so, on Sunday, December 11th, it landed in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Baja, California. The spacecraft floated in the ocean. It was met by the USS Portland and brought on board for a return to port. The entire flight lasted for 25.5 days, completing a 2.2 million kilometer journey. And as an interesting coincidence, this day matched exactly the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 17 moon landing, which of course, was the last time that humans set foot on the moon. Now that Orion is safely on the ground, we can look back and see how the overall mission went. And I've got to say it was almost close to perfect. There was one part earlier on in the mission when NASA lost communication with the spacecraft for about 45 minutes. That was a little unnerving, but they're able to restore communication. And then there were no more problems apart from the times when it went behind the moon, which is what they were expecting. The launch itself caused a lot of damage to the launch platform. You can see these amazing pictures of the elevator doors that are designed to carry the astronauts up when they go back on the next Artemis, they're going to need new doors, maybe a new elevator. Probably the biggest loss of the mission was the CubeSats. I mentioned earlier on that 
it released 10 CubeSats onto the same trajectory off to the moon. And within a few hours, it was obvious that many of them had already gone offline. Another one went offline a few days later. And at this point, we're about half of the CubeSats that were carried into space with Artemis One have gone offline. And there were some really cool missions in there that I was really excited about. There was a Japanese lunar lander. There was NASA's NIA scout which would send a solar sail to a near Earth asteroid. Neither of those are operational right now. I mean, technically, they weren't part of the Artemis one mission. They were ride sharing. But clearly, all of the delays going back and forth, the hurricanes, like none of that was good for these tiny spacecraft. Now, NASA has the Orion capsule in its hands, and it's going to start digesting all of the discoveries that were made by the spacecraft. There are going to be terabytes of data stored on its onboard hard drives, flash drives from all of those cameras. And so we're going to see a flood of data and results come onto the internet over the coming months and years. We're going to learn how well the spacecraft performed compared to the design. And that's really important when humans climb in for Artemis 2. And speaking of Artemis 2, the plan is for the next space launch system to blast off in 2024. But don't be surprised if it slips to 2025. There's a lot of things to do. This will carry four astronauts on a mission around the moon over the course of 21 days, including one Canadian astronaut, but no names yet. It's going to fly around the Earth twice to pick up speed and then take a free return trajectory around the moon and return to Earth. So a different trajectory than the one that Artemis one took. Then comes Artemis three, again, scheduled for launch in 2025. But come on, it's going to be delayed. But this is the big one. This is the time when humans come back to the moon. NASA has contracted SpaceX to supply a lunar lander version of Starship. The spacecraft will be flying in a near rectilinear halo orbit, the same orbit that the capstone mission has been flying on and the upcoming lunar gateway. It's an orbit that allows astronauts to easily reach the south pole of the moon. Two astronauts will land at the south pole of the moon near these deposits of water ice that are believed to be at the bottoms of the permanently shadowed craters. And this is very important for the future sustainability of missions to the moon. If you can extract water ice from the surface of the moon, you can use it for breathing, for propellant, for drinking water. There's a lot of uses for water. And so this is going to be a critical resource. Artemis three is going to help figure out if this ice is there and if it's accessible to astronauts. NASA has announced 13 potential landing spots, but we don't know which one it's going to be yet. And beyond that, the future is less clear. NASA has announced that they have contracted with SpaceX to provide another lunar lander. They've also opened up for bids from other companies to be able to provide lunar landings for Artemis missions beyond three and four. But we don't know how many are going to be there and how many are going to be landing on the moon. NASA is committed to at least Orion capsules to Artemis eight, and they've committed to core stages to Artemis six. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But we know there will be at least six Artemis missions, eight launches of Orion capsules. So there are a lot of outstanding issues to be done before humans can return to the moon. There need to be entirely new space suits developed. There need to be new equipment that can be used on the surface of the moon by the astronauts, experiments, rovers, and other infrastructure to come along with them. There's a long list of to do items before we can see humans walk on the moon and hopefully stay on the moon, eventually building a long term lunar base there. So I hope you enjoyed this it gives you a big overview of everything that happened during the Artemis one mission. I've got to say it feels kind of surreal to be standing here now on the other side of this mission, talking about the completion of Artemis one and Orion. It's been a long journey. But I think this time, it's going to stick. Not only is NASA returning to the moon, but there's a lot of other players, you've got the Chinese that are developing their plans to eventually send humans over the next decade. You've got various private missions, including SpaceX, which is saying that they're going to be able to send humans to the moon on Starship. There are other private collaborations between other companies. The European Space Agency is planning to build a lunar village on the surface of the moon. So this time, I think we're going to stay. But 2024, can't come soon enough with the launch of Artemis 2. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too.
We've been covering this story pretty obsessively at Universe Today, so obviously we've got dozens, probably hundreds of stories about the Artemis mission at this point. But you can also access links to other resources, and then I've put them all in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There, you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was our overview of the Artemis mission. Now, if you want more updates on a regular basis, you should come back, subscribe to the channel. We've got news every week, questions and answer shows, interviews with people behind the scenes in space and astronomy. I think you'll really enjoy it. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you.